um, I don't know if there is any French person uh, there, but uh, the title of my presentation is coming from a very well known and uh, highly erotic song by Serge Gainsbourg, sung by Jane Birkin in the 1970s. Je t'aime moi non plus, non plus. Uh, you don't need to know it, but it is an interesting, and there is nothing erotic in, um, in my presentation. In so, <laughs> it is an interesting approach of this kind of um, love-hate relationship between Greece and Europe, or I wouldn't say love-hate, it is a more complicated, let's say, relation to use um, Facebook uh, uh, names. It's a complicated relation which I will try to explain to you. So, um, many of the big, I mean, a lot of the issues that I'm going to talk have to do with history. I'm not a historian, but a lot of what I'm going to tell you has to do with history. Greece is a country with a long history and history is always a good means to understand the present, I think, and uh, I find it often in political science that a, a good analysis of today's political events requires a good knowledge of, a good analysis of the past. So, what I will try to, uh, to tell you in this lecture is to give you the general context of the relations between European Union or the European integration process more generally in Greece from the start of the European enterprise and to, to give you an understanding of this uh, ambivalent, uh, unclear relationship between the two sides, especially following the Eurozone crisis in the beginning of the, uh, of the last decade, all through the end of this decade. And to allow you to understand the role of Greece in the upcoming institutional and political developments in the European Union, especially in view of the Convention of the Future of Europe and the discussions on a more coherent political uh, role for the European Union. Uh, the first part uh, is uh, uh, the historical past uh, part, uh, which to a large extent is linked to contradictory terms, lack of trust and increased dependence. Uh, the relationship between Greece and what Greeks call the West in general has a long background uh, and it can be, let's say, the, the, po the position of today can be uh, traced back to the beginning of the second millennium. Uh, the, the most, uh, let's say, the, 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 the point that distinguished Greeks from the Latin West, Latin meaning Catholic in that point, is 1054 with the Great Schism, the division between Orthodoxy, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and Catholicism, the Pope, the Pope of Rome. Uh, as everything, it had political roots, dressed in, um, how to put it, in religious differences, but it was a fight over the primacy, not only of the Church, but even more of the Christian world. This separation of the two churches was the beginning of a distinction between the Greek Orient and the Catholic West. This division was uh, uh, exacerbated in 2004 when the Crusaders going towards uh, liberating uh, the Holy Land, uh, Jerusalem, instead stopped in uh, Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, seized the capital and um, provisionally, um, for some 60 years, uh, interrupted the Byzantine um, uh, 
uh, empire and the continuity of uh, a Greek speaking uh, state. Uh, the, the siege of uh, Constantinople in uh, in 1204 is perhaps of equal significance or even of more, more important for Greeks uh, than the siege of Constantinople two centuries later by the Turks. It pre, um, how to put it, it predated the decline of the Byzantine Empire and the strong attachment of Greece towards Eastern, uh, Eastern uh, mentalities, if you want. Uh, this relationship uh, became even more, um, sorry, even more um, complicated during the last period of the Byzantine Empire when the threat of the Ottoman invasion was obliging Greeks, the Byzantines, to seek support from the West. This is where the beginning of dependence I spoke to you in the very in, in the beginning starts to appear. Greeks were um, conscious of the need from Western support and at the same time reluctant to look for Western support. Uh, the pictures that you see here are the two main, let's say, expressions of those who preferred dependence from the West and survival from the Ottoman Empire and those who, prefer, who preferred to submit to the Ottomans rather than betray the Christian orthodoxy or the Greek particularity uh, towards the West. Uh, the defeat of uh, Byzantines and the occupation of uh, Constantinople, later on Istanbul, uh, in 1453 marks an important moment for Greece, for the Balkans in general, because contrary to what happened in the Western Europe, Greece remained under the Ottoman rule till the 19th century and was not included in the entire process of the uh, Renaissance and the Enlightenment. This is important to understand that for Eastern Europeans, the concept of Enlightenment, the concept of rational analysis of the world came as an import from the West in the 19th century. The long, almost four centuries period of Greek occupation uh, by the Ottomans did not lead to an increased support from the West. The, the expectations of liberation in uh, the Ottoman occupied Greek lands were mostly addressed to Russia, so to the Orthodox brethren, rather than to the Western uh, powers. When Greece started its one of its independence war, it was, which was successful in 1821, in the beginning of the 19th century, in the more general context of the national awakening, it was again the West, mostly, which allowed the Greek Revolution to become successful. And you are, you are looking at the Battle of Navarino, the naval battle of uh, Navarino in uh, 1827, uh, uh, when the, uh, the fleets of the three main powers of the period, England, France and Russia, defeated the Ottoman fleet and allowed for the independence, for an independent Greek state, which took place in 1830 and 1831. The Greek state of that period was a quite weak state. Greece was much smaller than it is now and 
even now it is not a huge country. It was a weak country, and it was a country torn again between East and West. This interesting um, um, picture, which you don't understand, is a picture of how Greeks saw and would see themselves. The, the upper part is Greeks dressed in traditional Oriental dresses uh, of the early 19th century, and how these people would look like when the Western form of dressing would reach the country. This division between Greek and, uh, let's say, Oriental and uh, uh, Western dressing is emblematic of a more uh, general hesitance of Greeks to follow the Western way of life and also the Western values and also the Western um, objectives or remain within the wider Oriental um, approach. Uh, this division to a large extent was a division between intellect, the elite or some part of the elite and the people and it was emblematic of the entire 19th and early 20th century. It was only in the very beginning of the 20th century that Greece fully espoused Western values and approaches from the establishment of party system and, system and civil liberties to the, um, let's say, adoption of uh, Western uh, standards in many um, aspects of life, uh, in society, in, uh, in the economy, and so on. Uh, the 20th century was a, century, a major um, transformative century for the Greek uh, state in so far as it reached its present borders. Uh, after the Greek-Turkish War of 1922, uh, there was a, a compulsory exchange of Greek-speaking populations from current Turkey and um, Muslim populations from current Greece, meaning that Greece was no longer aiming to expand towards more Greek um, Greek speaking areas. There was hardly most Greeks for the first time in the history of Greeks. Most Greeks were confined within the territory of the Greek state. And at the same time, uh, a level of political stability was achieved. However, this political stability in general was short-lived because democratic institutions and economic development were uh, intermittent. They were, Greece faced a number of internal strife and a number of uh, interruptions of democratic rule in, uh, during the 20th century. We had two civil wars and uh, three during the 20th century, we had uh, four times a change of regime between the monarchy and the parliamentary system. We had three major dictatorships and various uh, other coups. So the, we, we had, uh, uh, after the, se the second civil war, uh, following the second world war, uh, the left, uh, the communist party was banned. So Greece was to a large extent an imperfect or weak democracy, and up till the 1950s, a poor one as well. So, from the 1950s, let's say from the Second World War, Greece was looking towards the West, and in that time, the West had two aspects. Uh, the security aspect meant 
the United States, but the economic aspect more and more meant mainland Europe, Western Europe, and in particular after the 1950s, the European Economic Community. Uh, Greece did not join, was not invited to join the European institutions in the 1950s, uh, in the early 1950s, for, la for, for many reasons. It was un unable, it was, uh, first of all, geographically, it was far apart. Uh, economically, uh, the Greek uh, economy was not able to compete in a free market as the European economic community was. And uh, um, politically, the other European community member states were not considering that Greece was particularly um, apt to join them. Uh, however, uh, it was at the same time a major objective of the political elite for many reasons. Firstly, because of economic support, and secondly, in particular after 19, after the last dictatorship in Greece uh, in uh, uh, between 1967 and 1974, because it um, the West represented stability, political stability, and economic prosperity. So, the main objective of the post-dictatorship Greece in the 1970s was to join a family of democratic and economically advanced uh, economies and states. The main objective, therefore, was to join uh, the accession to the EC as a modernist exploration. The, the, the elite or a large part of the Greek elite was convinced that membership of the European Economic Community, as it was called at the time, would allow the return of the army to its institutional position, so the consolidation of democracy, and would permit Greece to invest more in economic policies in order to allow for, um, for the prosperity of the people. And that was the main objective of uh, the first post uh, post-dictatorship prime minister, who was uh, Konstantinos Karamanlis. He managed almost soul-handedly, I have to say, because to a large extent, the Greek economy was not yet adapted to, to the European standards. To allow Greece to join in uh, 1981, the European Economic Community, uh, without, I have to say, uh, a full support from the population. The dualism of the Greek mentality that I was talking to about uh, earlier, uh, the fact that for some Greeks, Greece, uh, Europe or the West was progress and that for some others the West was alienation, appears in these two emblematic, if you want, expressions by the two main leaders of the 1980s in Greece, Konstantinos Karamanlis, as I told you, who claimed that Greece belongs to the West, and Andreas Papadreou, leader of the Socialist Party, which was aspiring to, uh, to power, who was responding, saying that Greece belongs to the Greeks. Um, nevertheless, uh, the um, The differences in approach did not prevent membership, but it was important, and that was forgotten to a large extent by, um, by the leaders of Greece at the time, that Greece had a different approach and a different understanding of integration than the rest of Europe. Uh, for Greece, 
Greece was in the periphery of Europe and the relation between center and periphery was mu much more important for Greece than it was for other countries of the EC then. It was not the case when the Iberian countries joined later on, but Greece was the first peripheral country to join, uh, to, to join the EC. Also, there were specific relations um, between um, Greece and some member states. As I told you, uh, the, uh, the liberation of Greece was achieved to a large part from three main powers, Russia, England, and France. So the historic relation, especially with Russia, which was interrupted after the Russian Revolution, and with England, which continued all through the 19th and 20th century, uh, played a significant role in international, in Greece international relations. That meant that the role of EC in political um, developments uh, for Greece was much more, uh, much less important than it was for other European countries. In addition, there was a difference in the functional and territorial approach of Greece to the rest of Europe. I mean, Greece was separated from the rest of Europe. There were different uh, linkages than uh, the rest of Europe. The Balkans were much more important for Greece, and Asia Minor till the 1920s was almost uh, a natural expansion of Greece. So Greece looked at the rest of Europe as something totally different and with a completely different point of view than the Dutch would look into the relations with their neighbors. This difference of the background made that uh, Greece was unable to understand that distinctive pattern of integration that is a European integration, which allows for uh, a, a, an intrinsic liaison between various frameworks, between various layers and various levels. That meant that in the very beginning of integration, Greece was leaving its membership to the EEC as a strange phenomenon which could not be explained in the normal context of the relations between Greece and other states. So Greece was, for many years, was looking at Europe in an uncomprehensive way. Um, nevertheless, the membership of, e, of, of Europe, uh, of uh, the EEC, became quickly espoused by everyone. Uh, in the very beginning, I told you that uh, Greece joined uh, EC in 1981, and some months later, the Socialist Party came to power. Uh, the Socialist Party had a, a policy, or it's, let's say, um, a, a tendency against the against membership. They even had promised to organize a referendum to see whether membership should be continued or not. Nevertheless, very quickly, uh, the socialists, um, uh, which was a very particular socialist party at the time, it was much more radical socialist than social democrat, with um, strong populist elements and third world um, analysis of the, of the situation, but very quickly the socialists adapted to the European project, espoused it and became very pro-European, in particular because the very beginning of uh, Greek membership to the European Economic Community was extremely profitable in terms of financial support. Greece was the poorest country in the EC at the time, and was receiving a significant amount of funding for 
agriculture, regional development, uh, even social spending in some respect. Uh, this renewed economic prosperity to a large part supported by European membership allowed for the first time in its history as an independent state for Greece to become a wealthy, uh, a wealthy uh, nation. Greece was extremely poor. Uh, Greece was a poor country from the beginning. Um, that, that, nevertheless, uh, this period of um, prosperity and mutual happiness was to a large extent artificial. Uh, the European project was mostly built on an effort to avoid a, a fratricidal war like the Second World War. For Greeks, this was less how to put it, less perceived as an objective. Greeks looked upon the European project more as an economic objective and to some extent a political, but not as a political ob objective to avoid war, but rather as a political objective to consolidate democracy. For Greeks, the wars usually took place against neighbors, not against other members of the EEC, the Second World War uh, being an exception. So the traditional enemy in Greece was someone else. In the beginning, it was the communist countries of the Northern Balkans. Later on, after the 1970s, it was also Turkey, in particular Turkey. So the, 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 the conception of Europe as a haven of peace was lost in the Greek mind. And two other elements were making relations between Greece and the European, pro between Greeks rather, and the European project uh, more difficult. A strong element of nationalism within the Greek society and the important aspect of central government, which did not allow regionalization and multi-level relations as uh, um, you could see in other parts of uh, the European Economic Community. This led to avoiding having, um, how to put it, a, a genuine uh, European project in Greece. Nowhere uh, during that period and even later on, there was no real popular, let's say, attachment to the European enterprise beyond the small groups of persons that were um, involved into the European politics and those who benefited directly or indirectly from, from European integration. The, um, the sit this situation was enhanced by the fact that throughout that period, the Greek geopolitical priorities remained in the Mediterranean, in particular in the Eastern Mediterranean. And therefore, the main, let's say, um, international thrust of Europe, which was Latin America, Africa, the relationship with uh, uh, Eastern Europe, in particular after the 1990s, was much less felt in Greece, which was concentrated politically and mentally in the smaller area of the Balkans and the Eastern Mediterranean. This situation persisted to a large extent till the beginning of the Eurozone crisis. I don't want to go into very much into the Eurozone crisis. I have a lot, if you want, you can, you can look at it, but I would try more to, um, let's say, to, to, to look into the outcome than uh, the, the reasons, but I think that you have been, um, you have received the PowerPoint and you can look at that if you want. Uh, there are many reasons for the Eurozone crisis. Many of them were international. Some 
were domestic. I will stick to the domestic one because the international ones were rather than um, we know them all. Uh, membership of the European Economic Community and of the European Union and even of the Eurozone was not sufficiently accompanied in Greece by a modernization of its economy. It was the Greek state remained a colossus with feet of clay. It was an inefficient administrative structure while its capitalism, let's say the capitalist system was very much linked to the political system. Patronage and populism were um, significantly more present than in other, in other capitalist states and the internal political relations were more conflictual than in the past. Um, this statism, if you want, this uh, strong presence of the state in all aspects of the society led to significant party domination of the entire strata of the society and a weak civil society. This meant that in Greece uh, there were little and insufficient, insufficiently developed other non-state levels of decision making. And that is important to understand the significance of uh, the collapse of the economy to the entire uh, economic uh, system. Uh, this is quite a paradox because you, I don't know how many of you have visited Greece, but to, to, to an external observer, Greece is, an, is a Western state, a developed economy, one of the wealthiest developed economies as well, where modernism coexists even today to a large extent with um, anachronistic and uh, old fashioned ways of policy making. When Greece joined um, the, the Euro uh, at the same time, uh, these, let's say, weaknesses were to some extent covered or uh, hidden by the bonanza created by the single currency. Uh, the bonanza meant, especially in Greece, the capacity to borrow at a low level, at a low interest rate, not only for the state, but also for individuals. But this capacity, this borrowing, this increase in borrowing was not necessarily um, following, let's say, productivity objectives, but rather consumer objectives. So uh, borrowing was led, was, uh, was used for increased consumer uh, expenditure rather than for enhancing or strengthening the economic uh, uh, potential. Of course, uh, when the Eurozone crisis came, the weaknesses of the single currency appeared um, much more, uh, became much more evident. That was not the case on the Greece. I mean, all member states of the uh, of the periphery of the Eurozone suffered more or less the same situation. In Greece, it was much more uh, important for because not only because the economy of Greece was in a worse situation than others, but also for uh, reasons that were domestic, the incapacity of government of governments to, to reduce spending, the unwillingness of governments to, to reduce spending, and uh, the continuation of, of, of ex excessive uh, state spending in that respect. In, um, um, this meant that in the beginning, the, the, the economic, the, the international, the global crisis started in 2007-2008, it reached Greece in 2009 and in 2010 it became internationally evident. Now, to a large extent, 
as I explained to you, uh, the crisis had Greek roots, or let's say Greek causes, but the weaknesses of the Greek situation were to a large extent linked to the to, to European causes, to intrinsic European problems of monetary uh, integration. Yeah. We usually talk about economic and monetary union, but in practice, especially in the very beginning of the period of the euro, it was only a monetary union, meaning that there was hardly any economic governance, uh, budgetary policies remained national, and in addition, the Maastricht Treaty did not allow the European Central Bank to um, bail out, to undertake, to federalize, if you want, national debt. This meant that you could borrow, but you had to pay back yourself. You could borrow as Germany, to give you an example, Greece was, Greece was borrowing as if it were Germany, with the same interest rates, but while Germany had the capacity to pay back, Greece was left on its own when uh, this uh, need to pay back its borrowing was uh, put at the test. The Maastricht Treaty was to a large extent to blame because it was, as everything in the European Union, it was um, a compromise, and the compromise meant that federalization had to, um, let's say, to wait for a better period. So you had economic federalism, but you, economic federal an economic federal system without having a political federal uh, responsibility. So, um, when the Greek state declared its inability to uh, pay its debt, Europe was found in a situation of, uh, um, in, in a first time situation, there was no precedent for that. And to a large extent, the European member states were unable to to deal with, uh, with the fact. They asked for the support of the International Monetary Fund, and in the very beginning, at least, they, this led to um, what was called uh, the moral hazard. The fact that you cannot allow a state to not to pay its debt because this would increase the probability that other states would follow suit. So, to come to, to, to a conclusion, Greece was obliged to follow a very strong austerity policy, which led to uh, an increased uh, internal turmoil in order for the European member states, for the rest of Europe, basically, to uh, pay its obligations to third, uh, to third parties. So, in fact, the agreement was that Europe would take over the Greek debt and Greece would eliminate its national deficit. So, national elimination of a deficit means strong uh, uh, measures against uh, spending, uh, and a, a, a significant decrease in, um, in, in prosperity. The political impact of that was a collapse of the political system in, in Greece that followed 1974. The, main, the two main parties uh, lost significant ground and, and the new dividing line between those who were in favor of austerity and European support against those who were against that uh, appeared in Greece. There were um, wide uh, protests, a legitimacy deficit, and the rise of new political parties. Um, 
this rise of new political parties, uh, the, the, this development led to um, a rejection of the measure. So, contrary to what happened with other countries that uh, had to undergo similar, um, let's say, uh, austerity policies, in Greece there was a wide rejection of austerity measures, also because the austerity measures in Greece were much more um, press, uh, pressing than in other countries. Greece lost in in about uh, in eight years between uh, 2008 and 2016, Greece lost about a quarter of its, of its GDP, which is one of the highest um, reductions in GDP at times of peace or in general, I think, in, in economic situations. Uh, an anti-European feeling appeared, and that was also a contradiction because Greeks wanted to remain within the Euro. They, they were favorable to the Euro, but were against the necessity, well, the necessary measures that they had to take to remain within the Euro. Uh, and there was also a lack of ownership in reforms. Reforms were imposed on Greece in order to adapt the economy to modernity. But for many Greeks, these reforms were considered as foreign imposed, as imposed by the West, and therefore were mostly rejected. A strong anti-German feeling uh, was anti-European, but especially anti-German feeling was uh, um, uh, present. This is a, a cartoon uh, from uh, of the then finance minister of Germany, Wolfgang Schäuble, which was, uh, which is, um, um, how to, I'm trying to translate it. it. It says, the negotiations have started and Schäuble says, we insist that uh, we must have the soap from your grease, but we discuss whether your ashes can be used or not as um, What's the word in English? What we use for uh, um, helping the soil as as um, um, ingredient for 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 the soil. It, it was a very anti-German, and with a, you understand that strong element na, uh, elements of Nazi uh, reminiscences in that, and it, to to a large extent, it led to the. Um, uh, it led to, to a strong anti-European relations in uh, relationship with uh, um, with uh, with the rest of Europe. The Europeans, on the other hand, were also very much annoyed by the Greek reaction. It was a, uh, to, to 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 a large extent the approach of Europeans in towards the Greek crisis was very much a colonial approach, a colonialist approach, and to that respect was extremely offensive towards the Greek uh, mentality. Uh, this was uh, um, one of the uh, most uh, so, so, uh, yeah, the most popular newspapers in Germany, which was uh, suggesting that uh, Greeks should sell their islands and the Acropolis to pay their debt. So both sides, let's say, had a strong anti a, a strong uh, sentimental behavior towards that. And Greeks had the, uh, felt that they were treated as an occupied uh, people. Europeans thought that they were paying for uh, the debt of the lazy Greeks, and that uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, to a large extent blocked many reforms in the country. Uh, the, period of this crisis, as I told you, exp uh, led to, to new parties arriving in government. The most significant uh, to new parties arriving in the political scene and one of them taking over the government in 2015. It was the first time that an anti-establishment party reached government. I think it's the only time uh, in Greece, I mean, unless we can call the, the Five Star Movement as an anti-establishment party, but it never reached power on its own. Uh, the rise of Syriza, of the coalition of radical left to power, was extremely um, 
how to put it, extremely interesting from a political scientist point of view, because it was a party that in 2009 had only 4% of the vote. It was a traditional leftist uh, intellectual party, let's say, and suddenly within four years, it reached 36%, 36% of the vote. It was a vote of reaction to a large extent, but it was also a vote that Greeks gave to a party in order to find a new way, let's say, uh, to avoid a, a persistent, um, persistent austerity. Uh, when um, it's a long story, which I don't want you to to know by now, because I know that my time is uh, coming to an end. I think I don't know if I can have another five minutes, uh, Giovanni, uh, so that we have some time to discuss. If Syriza came to power. Initially, it tried to negotiate a different approach, failed, was forced to accept a new bailout agreement with even stronger positions uh, than the previous one. But it made a good day out of a rainy season in the sense that it adapted as the Socialist Party had done in 1981, it adapted to a large extent to um, the European requests and gradually moved from a radical standpoint to a more social democratic, if you want, to a more established standpoint. At the same time that most Europeans realized that austerity only cannot work. So from 2015 and onwards, a large element, uh, these are some pictures of the then prime minister and the, the first time economy minister of the Syriza with the main uh, important actors uh, of European integration at the time. Uh, the, um, the problem was exasperated in 2000, again with the refugee crisis, which was perceived again differently from Europeans and from uh, Greeks. Europeans, I, I, I am sure that you remember the number, the, the increasing number of refugees arriving from uh, Syria, mostly through Turkey to Greece and then onwards to the rest of Europe. For Greeks, the refugee crisis was another proof of Western abandonment. For Europeans, the refugee crisis was another proof of Greece's incapacity to withhold arrivals, and these arrivals ended up in uh, the north of Europe, in Germany, in Netherlands, and uh, uh, Sweden mostly. After 2016, however, as I explained to you, the European position became less inflexible in the sense that Europeans realized that an element of development has to be added to the austerity measures, otherwise nobody can, uh, no, there is no possibility of genuine uh, development of genuine economic uh, recovery, if you want. And uh, um, the gradual improvement of the world economy after 2013, and especially after 2014, meant that also Greece went through a period of relative stability. After 2016, there was an increase in uh, GDP. So Greece started to recover and to some extent to this, it restored trust to, to the European Union, partly because uh, the new government, the social, the, the Syriza government had uh, changed its discourse against Europe. But that was a relationship still without love. Uh, it changed a little bit when the Conservative Party of Nea Democratia uh, came uh, to power in 2019. It, Nea Demokratia was the party which originally brought 
Greece into the EC in 1981, and the new leader of Nea Democratia was much more pro pro European, if you want, than the previous prime minister. Nevertheless, such a relation uh, is still uh, unclear relation for many reasons. The first is the aspect of the Greek Turkish relation in the last three years, let's say since 2019, there is a wide um, discussion about the hypothetical existence of gas um, of, of gas and oil, but mostly gas in the uh, Mediterranean, in the Eastern Mediterranean, leading to, to, to an increased uh, friction between Greece, Turkey, Cyprus as well, and um, the rest of the Mediterranean, of the Eastern Mediterranean countries. Uh, not a single cubic meter of gas has been found yet, but still, the Greek Turkish relations have become much more um, tense in recent years than in the past. And the support of Europe in this um, conflict is insufficient for many reasons, because as I told you, European priorities, international priorities do not necessarily uh, follow the Greek ones and vice versa. So for, for Europe, especially for Germany, Turkey is a significant partner also in relation to uh, the refugee uh, situation and to, to a large extent because of the COVID uh, emergency. The COVID emergency has given rise to the recovery fund, which um, to a large extent uh, allows for uh, a more solidary European Union, the emphasis on solidarity was a, a significant aspect of Greek demands throughout the period of the crisis. There was less, the Greeks perceived very little a genuine solidarity, both in the economy and in the refugee crisis. The recovery fund, the recovery and resilience fund, to some extent, uh, meant this, uh, uh, meant this uh, lack, but uh, it remains to be seen, and this is uh, my conclusion, whether this misalliance, if you want, whether this misunderstanding, whether this lack of love uh, between Greece and Europe will persist even after the new elections in Germany and the unclear situation of the uh, financial and political stability of Europe in the coming uh, in the coming years. That's all from my side. Thank you for your attention and I'm ready to hear questions and uh, comments. Okay, so thank you very much, Janis. Uh, and uh, so the first, uh, <laughs> the first uh, thing that uh, uh, comes to my mind uh, is that uh, from the return from what you call the return to normality and since then since uh, the what you call the return to normality so greece disappeared from uh, the european screens and newspapers so this is <laughs> so this is very this is very interesting right luckily uh, yes and so um, so my my so first of all uh, uh, so the, the the floor is open now to to students questions uh, or or comments uh, and uh, of course you can uh, take the word uh, on the chat or uh, using your mic uh, as you like and uh, okay so please feel free, free to do it and uh, so my first question is about your perception of this uh, of this story that you told us, no? that is uh, that is your perceptions about the approach of the European Union towards Greece. That is, do you think that uh, the European Union approach towards Greece was, uh, you know, legitimate? Was legitimate? And what do you think about the basic accusations 
by the European Union against against Greece and against uh, his, you know, against its uh, its problems. For example, corruption and uh, and 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 so on. Mm. So this is very interesting because uh, maybe in every country of the European Union uh, the same story was told uh, in many different ways in, in newspapers and so on. So this is very important. Um, your perception about uh, uh, about this and about uh, you know about the basic accusations of the European Union against uh, against Greece. Um, yeah, it's a long, uh, I don't know, do I take other questions or I apply to one by one? How, what well, you... one by one, it is better. Okay. Um, okay, let's start. Um, Greece joined an economic union. So this economic union lacked, let's say, controls capacity. They could control whether a specific fund was used or a specific support was used for the objective that it was uh, assigned to, but there was very little uh, Europe or the European institutions could do to, to go into the rationale of uh, the policies of the country. There were, it was also, to a large extent, outside the remit of the European Union. This was not only the case of Greece, that was everywhere. Having said this, everyone knew in the European Union that, for instance, Greece joined the Eurozone under, how to put it in a polite way, improved statistics. So if we follow, let's say, the, uh, the letter of the Maastricht, Treaty, especially the letter of the uh, stability pact, uh, Greece could should not have joined the monetary union because the economy of Greece was still uh, un unprepared for monetary union. On the other hand, the but everyone knew that. The membership of the Eurozone, to a large extent, in the beginning of uh, the Eurozone, was uh, a political choice. Italy is exactly the same case. Italy joined because Italy was an important country. It was uh, a founding member. And therefore, we could um, uh, forget various aspects of the Greek, uh, of the Italian uh, economy, which were not in line with the uh, stability mechanism. This was the case in Greece. Uh, so, how to put it? Um, the accusations of European institutions towards Greece were correct, but this does not prevent the fact that they all knew what was going on in the past and they let go as they let go other European countries do the same. So, in, in some respect, um, it was, you know, the sort of a conspiracy to, to not to say anything, which was broken at the moment of the crisis. Uh, one important aspect of uh, the Greek crisis, which the Greeks paid, but might have been, might be useful in the future, is that it allowed Europeans to reflect on how to deal with similar situations in the future. Because as I, I think I spoke to you in the very beginning, the, the first three, two or three years of the Greek crisis were spent on a sort of a, a effort from the part of Europeans to punish not only the Greek behavior, but especially to punish similar behaviors in the future. So Greeks were used as um, testi testimonies of what will happen to someone who will not follow the rules. <laughs> Which from an economic, from, from a moral point of view might be correct. You have to punish somebody so that uh, the other... Uh, to educate uh, the others. 
exactly. But from an economic point of view, it was totally uh, useless in the sense that uh, it appears in the event that when a, an economy is under economic pressure, austerity measure, pressure further more demand and therefore increase the recession. So from an economic point of view, the treatment of the Greek economy was totally, um, what's the expression? It was, uh, it, it was more than, what, how do they say in English? It's more than the mis a mistake, it, is an, it was an error. It was, uh, it, it was a totally useless three year or four year um, pressure upon a, a people which to some extent were, I mean, uh, it, is, it is also important to understand that um, the, the policies of Greece that led to the crisis were policies that were accepted by many Greeks. I mean, corruption, uh, party politics, uh, clientelism were part of, let's say, the agreed social contract in the beginning of the country. And uh, Greeks were, were not satisfied, but were content in having that because at some point, you know, if I have a good, um, a good contact with uh, a political party or with an MP, I can even get something myself. So everybody, many people, let's say, thought that it's not as bad to have a little bit of corruption because it helps at an individual level. But from an, if you look <laughs> into the global picture, uh, if you look into the global picture, the, the European policy towards Greece was ineffective. So uh, it took Europeans some years to understand that punishing is not an economic. Uh, it is a moral, but not an economic uh, means. And then they went into looking to other reasons that uh, forced this uh, crisis, like uh, insufficient banking supervision, um, over uh, allowing banks to, to lend to a larger extent without uh, sufficient uh, collateral. So it, it allowed Europeans to build a better economic management system. Um, now, uh, it was not legitimate in one sense because uh, the main aspect, the main problem of European policies even today, is the inability to pinpoint a specific person who is responsible for economic policy in Europe. So it goes back into the element of democratic legitimacy. You have to have a person who will be responsible, who will be accountable for the European economy, and this is not definitely the uh, Commission of the Economy, you need to have a much more, um, how to put it, popular relationship between economic governance and political uh, accountability. But when you talk about the return to normality, you also mean, uh, you also mean uh, uh, the economic recovery, right, of the country. Uh, a return to, norm to normality meant, in the first place, a return to normality in Greece was the capacity of Greece to, um, how to put it, to, to avoid being in the context of bailout for three years after mm -hmm. 2015 till 2000, till the summer of 2018. Greece was on a bailout, meaning that it was not able to borrow. One important thing. After the summer of 2018, and especially in 2019, Greece went again to the markets, which meant that it was, it left, in quotation mark, the 
financial prison. It became a, a, a sovereign economy again, to the extent that we can say that economies in the Eurozone are sovereign now, but it became an economy that is not different from Portugal or uh, Irish economies in the sense that they can borrow. And we have a number, there are a number of obligations that still went on. They are provisionally um, say suspended because of COVID, but Greece was obliged to have um, a strong uh, surplus every year. So this surplus, uh, in order to, to pay back gradually the Greek debt. So every year we have to have a surplus. We didn't have a surplus. Uh, well, since the beginning of uh, COVID, we, everyone has a deficit. I mean, even the, the Greek deficit reached, I think, 8% last year. So it was an important... Uh, yeah, but for example, I, I remember that the the salaries of public employees, you know, were 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 cut, you know, by by. Yeah, that, the, so yes. yes uh, but have they, have they been restored and when? No, absolutely not. Um, the the impact of the austerity, to mm. a large extent, remains, especially the structural impact. For instance, Greece, as many other European countries, has increased a lot. Pension ages, so people go to pension at uh, at a later stage than in the past. Civil servants uh, have a lot of uh, a, a part of the civil servant salary has been cut from 2010 till 2015. It has not been restored. Uh, there is a small increase in the salaries of the private uh, sector, so uh, this follows a little bit the economy, but to a large extent, um, the measures that were imposed during uh, the uh, during the, the period of uh, the bailout are still in place in terms of the number of uh, civil servants. You see, the number of civil servants was reduced significantly. So to some extent, to, to a large extent, uh, how to put it? To give you an example, my I am now um, a associate professor. Yes, in, we in wanted general. to know your salary. Well, I can tell you that uh, it's not me. It's not a significant, but I can tell you that <laughs> now, as an associate professor, my salary is a little bit higher than my entry salary when I joined the university it was two thousand seven as a lecturer which means that uh, in practice, civil servants have remained, have lost part of their salary in 2009-10 and have remained in more or less the same situation since then. There, is, there are uh, rises, pay rises, but they're mostly linked to um, um, do you call it to 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 the fact that you spend more years every some years there is a small increase in your salary because of your uh, um, of your um, status but there is no real increase in salaries uh, there is a smaller increase in pensions persons in pensions got an increase and the private sector also has an increase but this increase does not offset what was lost still now does not offset was what was lost in uh, in the beginning of the 2010. That's it. This is linked to to a large extent. Uh, this is one of the side effects of the single currency. One of the means that governments had in the past when the economy was not going well was devaluation. With the single currency, Greeks could not devaluate the euro, obviously. Mm. So basically, they, the, the, a new system was imposed, which was called inter domestic devaluation. So instead of devaluating the currency, you devaluate the cost of productivity in the country in order to reduce, uh, to, to reduce the productivity gap. So my 
how to put it, uh, if my productivity was 10 students a year, let's say, I mean, that's stupid, but if my productivity is 10 good students a year, <laughs> my salary, if my, again, my salary were 2,000 per month, it would mean 200 per student. If my salary is 1,500 per month, it would mean 150. So the cost of a good student for the state becomes uh, less significant. So this basically Greece followed or was forced to follow uh, uh, the path of what we call domestic devaluation or indirect devaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see whether there are any comments, uh, any comments or or um, or questions uh, on the chat or 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 through the mic. Because otherwise I have many questions, you know, I have many questions because uh, no, it is, it is, you know, very interesting. Also, the other side of the relations, the tea of the relation between uh, the between Greece and the European Union. That is, um, what is in your opinion, if any, uh, the contribution of uh, Greece to, you know, to the European Union in terms of policies, in terms uh, of that is, uh, that is, uh, principles, uh, in terms of values, or in terms of uh, priorities for the European Union, even, even in terms of foreign policy, for example, European Union foreign policy. Uh, that, that's, so on. That, is, that is another aspect of this uh, permanent misunderstanding. Um, and to that extent, I think Greece is more to blame than, uh, than Europe. But uh, I, I, one of the problems that I have seen, having worked in the European uh, institutions, mm -hmm. I was, it, for me, it was extremely evident that the Greek representatives in meetings uh, were not, could not adapt to the way of discussing at European level. To give you an example, um, Lithuanians, I don't know, um, every, every member state has uh, its own priority. So Lithuanians are against Russians, I, Irish want, uh, I don't know, the Northern Ireland issue, uh, Portuguese uh, want to help, uh, what was the name of this island? Timor, uh, Timor, less, uh, much more. So everyone had a, um, their own priorities, which they brought to the meetings. But they made efforts to show an interest on other member states' interests as well. So the Portuguese would occasionally say, OK, tell us, Lithuanians, what are your problems with the Russians? To a large part, especially in the very beginning, Greek politicians were indifferent or impervious rather to the priorities of other member states and only uh, insisted on our own priorities. And the Greek priorities in terms of po international politics can be, uh, let's say, uh, summarized into one word, Turkey. So to a large extent, the capacity of the Greek administration to influence European policies was limited. This doesn't mean that it was not there, because, uh, as I said in the very beginning, Greece was the first poor state to join the EC. And in the very beginning, the Mediterranean integrated programs, the emphasis on uh, um, more regional development policies was instigated by the pressure from Greeks, but it was also instigated in the sense that it was not only Greeks who were complaining, it was that the European Union itself understood that there must be more solidarity measures if you want to have a, an economic development which is more or less um, just throughout the EEC, especially in the 1980s. To a large extent, um, social policies also 
were, um, how to put it, were promoted by Greece. Um, on the other hand, um, in terms of international or, or foreign policy, Greece um, has been at odds with the mainstream European. I mean, we are emphasizing the danger from Turkey and we are under emphasizing uh, the relationship or the opposition with Russia. I mean, Greece uh, has a traditional political and uh, let's say cultural link to Russia, which was, as I told you, during the communist period, this was uh, sort of hidden. But after the 1990s, there is a strong political, or not political, there is a strong uh, cultural linkage with Russia. So, for instance, Greeks are extremely reluctant to accept uh, um, the sanctions uh, decided by Europeans against uh, Russia, both on Crimea and on Russian misinformation campaign. So, there is, Greece is, uh, it's also, it has also had to do with the economic uh, reality. I mean, uh, to a large extent, Russian tourists are a significant uh, component of the Greek tourism, but there is also a political linkage into that. So, I would say that the emphasis, what one can pinpoint as, a, as an important Greek aspect is uh, Greek contribution to the EU, besides the fact that, as we all know, everything comes from Greece, democracy, rule of law, etc. So, we, we, we draw on that, but uh, modern Greece's contribution to some extent has to do, has more uh, in areas of solidarity, economic solidarity, regional solidarity, than in terms of foreign policy. One of the frustrations of Greece uh, was also uh, that uh, the Greek priorities were not taken into account sufficiently by the rest of Europe. But as I told you, Greek priorities are, were mostly uh, in relations to Turkey and to the relation between Cyprus and Turkey. I, I saw some no. I, I... Yes, so there is a there is a question from Arina. Arina, please you can take the mic and if you like, also you can switch on your camera. Where are you? Where are you from? That is, where are you now? Uh, hello, I'm from Russia, from Moscow, uh, from Gimio University. And first of all, thank you very much for uh, the insight into the EU Greek relations and. Um, I would say that it was very helpful, especially for students from the non-European uh, Union uh, member countries. And um, I have a question concerning the uh, impact of the COVID. And uh, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but when the pandemic generally started, um, the response of the European Union wasn't as fast uh, at first and as efficient as some countries might have expected. And uh, especially, we could uh, we could hear some uh, severe criticism from some countries which were hit the first uh, by the pandemic, for example, uh, Italy. And uh, does it provoke Euroscepticism in Greece as well, or uh, or was the situation quite positive uh, given the history of uh, Greek EU relations during the financial crisis? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm not an expert in, in health issues, but I will tell you what I know. Um, first of all, you probably know that health is not um, a competence of the European Union. It is a subsidiary, uh, not subsidiary, what's it called? It a supplementary competence, <coughs> which means that basically it is member states that are involved uh, in policy making and especially in uh, budgetary aspects. Health, uh, health policy was a very small uh, in, term, in terms of uh, financial support uh, policy of the European Union and basically it dealt with issues such as I uh, they call orphan drugs or uh, um, um, you know support in um, uh, how to put it in um, coordination measures 
So there was not really, uh, health was not an issue uh, for Europe. In addition, in the very beginning, uh, member states practically told the European Commission to stay where they are and do nothing. So to a large extent, I mean, I don't want to, to, to justify the European Commission, but to a large extent, the beginning of the crisis, of the COVID crisis was very much uh, national driven or government driven uh, process, not because or not only because the European Union was not competent, but also because the member states did not want the European Union to become um, more involved. Um, having said this, in the, Greece miraculously, miraculously um, remained outside the first wave of uh, COVID. So uh, we were lo in lockdown as practically ever in Europe, but the number of casualties and in the very beginning was uh, small. I mean, Greece went through a very lethal wave of uh, COVID in autumn last year. So a little bit later than other European countries. And it was involved, basically, the, the period where we suffered more from COVID, I mean, we still suffered, but we suffered more from COVID, was the period that um, the discussion on the vaccine became um, a reality. So to some extent, my reply is that it did not allow, it did not lead to an increased Euroscepticism in Greece. It I know that um, uh, it led to, to challenging uh, European Union because of the way the European Union uh, was involved in the um, purchase of vaccines, especially in the very beginning, there were all these uh, uh, hiccups with uh, AstraZeneca and uh, I mean, the Commission didn't do it its best at the time. Uh, of course, it is European money now that pay for the vaccines, I think. But, uh, so, to some extent, European Union has uh, make amends. But to, to reply to you, um, it was not felt as a European issue in Greece. It was felt as a Greek issue. The government was successful in the beginning, was not successful in the second part. But it was, I mean, uh, let's say the, the opinion of Greeks regarding COVID were mostly driven towards their own government than towards Europe. So it did not, I do not think that it led to more Euroscepticism. On the contrary, because of COVID, we had the recovery fund, which gave mm. an impetus to pro-European feelings because we, there is money involved, basically. 